Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to uh, get started uh, again. Um, we've been discussing a tricky set of concepts, so I just want to to revisit <clears throat> some of those basics so that we can be grounded in a common understanding of of what's going on and what we're trying to do. You recall that that if we we are speaking about the situation which is very common when we're dealing with complex systems. <clears throat> with these systems uh, they are typically tangled. So one part of the system ends up affecting another uh, change and and uh, uh, doctor uh, uh, the availability of primary care doctors, thanks super much, affects uh, what goes on in the ED. Um, changes in uh, case management strategy for, for those struggling with substance abuse leads to uh, presentations in the ED uh, of uh, individuals with a uh, larger number of uh, mental health issues. Um, changes in prescribing policy on the part of doctors leads to, for opioids, leads to uh, increases in um, case volumes for social services workers and larger number of overdose calls for police. We deal commonly with tangled systems where poking at one part of the system leads to changes throughout the system. And the tools of system science are geared to dealing with those systems. It's why we build system science models. It's why we need so much insight from these models so we can make better decisions. Because often in these systems, because when you poke here, lots of things happen, and often not obvious things, we need to learn how to poke more judiciously, how to poke more carefully, where to poke, where has Biggest leverage, what will lead to the, most, uh, the largest change, what will avoid uh, dangerous blowback or side effects, what things will be cost effective, what things will lead to rapid change, etc. <clears throat> we build models for these systems. But these systems, because they're coupled, because they exhibit this kind of pervasive causality. They have an additional feature too when it comes to data. And anyway, when it comes to topics of data science that you simply will not hear discussed in, in broader concepts of data science because of the lack of connection with the system science community. And that is that the data that comes from any one stream of regularly sampled data within these systems that we collect and collect in increasing abundance with novel types of, of data collection mechanisms. That data tells us not just about the part of the system where ostensibly it's collected, where at the most obvious level it's collected, but it whispers to us about the broader system. So that time series that Lugia was working on, uh, showing uh, the waiting times for patients in the emergency room, it whispers to us about what's going on in the wards. It whispers to us about, about mental health issues in the community. It, it whispers to us about ALC patients, these alternative level of care patients who are stranded in acute care because of lack of service availability in the community. And the information about these other parts of the system is, is packed into these data sets that might seem on the, at a naive level to be from one part of the system. And we saw that Taken's embedding theorem derived in the, the 1980s demonstrated mathematically a principled way by which you could unpack this information about the broader system from any one time series from the system.
And using this approach, we take one time series and by transforming it in a mechanical fashion, we end up with a picture of the dynamics of the broader system. Now, the basic approach used in this way, transforming this data, mechanically transforming it, is to perform what's called delay embedding. And here, we go from a time series that might be consist of thousands of data points. And for each point in that time series, it's important, for each point in the time series, not right at the end or, or, or at the very beginning, um, we, we create what's called uh, an embedding vector. And basically, for that point in the time series, let's say y of 100, we create a vector of, of a certain length. And we call it the length of that vector e. It's the embedding dimension. Say if it's 3, we have that element at that time 100. And then we have elements at earlier times. If tau is 1, we have y of 100, y of 99, and y of 98. That is 100 minus 1 and 100 minus 2 successively. By contrast, if tau is 10, we have y of 100, y of 90, and y of 80. In any given analysis, we pick E and we pick tau to, to do the reconstruction. E is the length of many of these things, and what do you say, E minus 1 times tau? And, and then the, um, uh, the, the tau determines how far the, how uh, spaced apart, far spaced apart these, um, these reconstructions are. Um, and I argued that when we see a complex system, it can be produced by model, it may be produced from the world, we can take the time series from that system and we can place them into an embedding space of dimension E. Why dimension E? Because each of these points is given by the vector of length E that we just reconstructed, this, this kind of vector of length E, has E entries in it. So this, say this is for X axis, Y axis, and Z axis. That would be three dimensions, like, like here, okay? Um, and we have these different tools for reconstructing it, one of which will be making its way to a corner near you or actually a corner near me, even closer to me, right over there, okay? Um, and I argued that parameters like E and, and tau do have some impact, um, but generally we can deal with, with some amount of uncertainty about them. And, and I noted that tau in particular, um, it kind of interacts with time series which are sampled at different, at different rates. So I noted that this sort of space is, it's, in addition to being really neat, it's, it's really useful for certain purposes. But the purpose that we're gonna focus on today is assessing causal influences from convergent cross mapping, okay? And this convergent cross mapping, the point of convergent cross mapping is to, to identify and assess the strengths of causal connections between variables. To distinguish, if we have multiple variables, say variable A and variable B, we can tell if variable A is causally driving variable B, if B is causally driving variable A, if both are causally driving each other, or if neither is the case. And it's not, we're, talk, we're not talking about here if they're correlated. That's an entirely different dimension, but that's an entirely different issue. And one of the features of complex systems is that, um, uh, one of the features of complex systems is that you can have causation with correlation. You can have causation without correlation. Causation does not always leave its footprint in the form of, of correlation. You can have correlation without causation. This is not about correlation. These, these techniques are robust 
to the presence of correlation. I'll show some examples of that. Although it has to be, it is something that has to be watched for. Okay, um, so here we are, we are arriving at a mechanism that can identify causality between variables. Those students in the room, your ears should be perking up in a serious way because these systems are not out there. And if you're interested in making use of big data in useful ways, one of the things would be to screen for causal signals, be, uh, causal influences between, um, between uh, certain patterns of measured factors to discover um, uh, previously unrecognized or unassessed uh, uh, causality in the world. Convergent cross-mapping is an approach that draws on these shadow manifolds that we talked about. It's one of the uses, as I said, of those shadow manifolds, okay? And the idea is this. We have a time series shown here at we have some see, time on the x-axis and x of t on the y-axis. So for a given time t, we can say what x is. Maybe x is the length of waiting times in the emergency room. Maybe X is the number of suicide attempts over time within Saskatoon. Maybe X is the number of lobsters caught off the coast of Maine. <coughs> so here we have some time series, some observations over time. And from that, using this embedding procedure we just saw, this sort of this sort of embedding, we, we embed it. And specifically, I'm showing an embedding here. So we, we take this and we reconstruct this, this set of paths from this. This is the sort of transform of this through delay embedding. Now, having done that, convergent cross-mapping seeks to use that so-called shadow manifold. This is a shadow manifold of of, of X. It's the state space whispered to us by X. Maybe I should call it a whisper manifold. Um, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reasoning here about, <coughs> to, to identify the presence of correlation, we're going to be reasoning how the correlation between, now this is reconstructed from X, how the correlation from Okay, so we're trying to see if y impacts x. The variable y is driving x. For variable y is a causal influence in x. We're gonna reconstruct this from x, from the time series for x, and then we're gonna ask, how does, if we consider a point shown in red, and we consider the nearby points in, in this reconstructed state space, in this shadow manifold, the points that are nearest to that, and we consider the correlation between the values of y associated with each of those points, because each of them is a point in time that has a specific value in the y time series. If we consider each of these as being labeled, each of these, yellow, these um, green points as being labeled with their corresponding y from that point in time. Each of those is from a specific point in time, just like y, uh, the red point is from a specific point in time, it has a certain value of y, so it is with the greens. Okay, um, and we consider those Ys for the red point versus the average of the Ys for the green, sort of a weighted average. We ask what are the correlation between those? And we ask not only for one reconstruction, we ask for a reconstruction based on different subsets of this, um, of, of so-called length L, which is which basically uh, corresponds to what's called the library size. So we consider different subsets of this time series and we reconstruct for each of them that. And we consider as L grows, how does the correlation between, uh, between the uh, value of Y as, as uh, estimated by the surrounding points, the, the green ones, relate to the um, to the value of y from the, uh, the red one there. We consider that as L, L changes, okay? Um, so 
I want to emphasize, we're going, to be, we're going to be talking about this, and it's, it bears noting something I emphasized before lunch. These points here, these green points, are the closest point to the red one, to the index point, to this point of interest, in terms of state space. They could be from very different points of time. You remember, if this one here, the red one, is from this point in time, there may be other points in state space very close to it. For example, this guy here at around time roughly 50, and this point here at around time 670, and maybe uh, 950 or something. Um, those ones might con contribute points near this red one in the sense that they're from similar points in state space. They have similar patterns of what was the value at the previous, uh, at the current point, the previous point, and the previous point, the point two times ago. And so they're at similar points in state space. So they're from nearby points in state space. And the idea, crudely speaking, is that, look, if, if x is driven by y causally, that'll be, y will be part of the state space. And so things that are nearby in state space will have nearby values of y, because y is a dimension of state space. So close by in state space means close by in y. Because y is driving x, it's part of the reconstructed state space. It's, it's part of the state of the system that contributes to x. By contrast, if, if y is not driving x, then being close in state space won't tell you much about y, is the idea, crudely speaking. And we're going to go through a lot of cases, including some with, with correlation. Okay. Um, and we're going to consider this um, as we consider points around this red point that are closer and points around the red point that are less close, okay? Um, if we consider points where we have situations where we have few points from the time series in here, then, then basically the surrounding points won't be too close to this red one. They won't be too packed in there because they're fairly sparse, okay? And, and uh, as a result, the average value of y for these will tend to be less, less close to y than if they were all really, really, than that of y if they were compared to if they were really, really tightly clustered around there. If, if, uh, if x is, if y is driving x, then if these points are really tightly clustered around this point, they're gonna, they should have quite similar, because closeness in state space means closeness in y, they should have very similar values of y. But if they're really far spread out, because there aren't too many points being considered overall, then their, their values of y are not gonna be super close to that at the red point. That's the idea. That's, that's the idea here. Okay, um, Okay. so another way you can look at this, and it's sometimes explained by its inventor, Sugihara, is, is asking how tight is the mapping between points in the reconstruction from X and the reconstruction from Y. That's another, another way to look at it, um, which can be, uh, can be fruitful. Okay, um, so to talk about this, this it's going to sound strange for those hearing this for the first time. But in order to quantify the existence of a causal connection, one that is not distracted by just correlation, one can recognize there can be correlation without causation, acute causation without correlation, capture causation is distinct. We do need some way of formalizing this, this idea that the value of these points around it is close to the value of, of this red dot. And we're going to see how close it is as we increase the density of the space, as we consider more and more of this time series. And the way in which you do it is we have this correlation coefficient rho. But this correlation coefficient is not, I repeat, is not, I repeat, is not a correlation between time series. This correlation coefficient is a correlation between 
the value of y's on the surrounding data points, the average value of y's surrounding data points versus the, the data point of, of, of uh, the index data point, that red data point. Okay, so it's a Pearson cor uh, correlation coefficient. Okay, and the idea is we're going to do this for different so-called libraries of size L, different subsets of this, of different sizes, and some will, and for a given L, it'll lead to a certain sparseness of this graph. And then as we increase L's, we take more and more points, this graph will become more and more tight. It'll become less and less sparse. And we're gonna be inter interested in seeing how this value of rho changes as it becomes tighter, as it becomes a, a tighter space, a, a, a more heavily packed space, a less sparse space. Okay. So we're going to consider a couple of cases to try to develop intuition. We're going to show you graphs from CCM type analyses that will help you understand this. Well, CCM analyses. Okay, the first case is there is a causal connection between X and Y. That is, Y is driving X. Okay, um, perhaps this is a case of unemployment driving through other, other variables, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of uselessness to the family, um, risk of suicide, uh, in, uh, particular, particularly in, in, uh, in breadwinners for the family, former breadwinners. And, uh, and so we have variable y and we posit it's driving x. And in this case, we're going to examine a case where it's actually driving it. We know because we we created this example. Okay, so what happens when, it, when you see this? Well, what happens when we have this situation is that rho will rise as we consider larger and larger so-called library sizes. We consider fill in more and more points from the original time series into this reconstruction. As we consider more and more of this time series, larger and larger subsets of it, and reconstruct it. This, we're going to be going from widely spaced data points to tightly packed data points. And, and the correlation with the value of y at the point here compared to what we would deduce from the average y for the points around it is going to get tighter and tighter. And it's going to, it's going to look like this. This is what it's going to look like, OK? So uh, I'll explain this graph. Um, we'll pause to explain this graph because these graphs are going to accompany us. So what we hear, see here on the two axes are to be explained. And they, they should link in with my explanation right now, but I want to walk through them slowly. The y-axis is rho, okay, this correlation coefficient. That's what I, I just introduced here. That's the Greek letter rho. Okay. It's basically a correlation between how tightly these surrounding data points, y at these surrounding, the average of y at these surrounding data points are compared to, compared to at this point itself, the center point around which these are the closest ones. So we've, this is the state space reconstructed from variable x, from time series x, and we're trying to know does time series y, the variable associated with time series y influences, we're going to be looking at the correlation how well these points around here, if they predict y compared to, to the actual value for the point they surround, how closely correlated are there? And we will change L. So this is rho, this is that correlation, and this is L, the library size, okay? This is the how, how much, how, how big are the windows of that graph we're considering? And you'll notice for each L, we have many, many, many points. And that's because we're sampling different L's within, uh, within the space uh, to compute these rows, these values of rows. So we're sampling, there are many possible windows of size 10. Of, of, of all different windows in here. Um, and w windows of size 1,000, there's many windows of those. And each of those will contribute some of these, these data points. 
And this is a density plot, meaning it, it gives a sense with color as to how many points fall within a given region. And uh, blue, uh, so gray means uh, ain't nothing that fell there. Um, blue is, okay, not many fell there. This red is a lot fell there, okay? A lot fell up there. So what we're seeing here is as L changes, as L rises, as the library size rises, in short, as we are considering larger and larger subsets of this, and we're going from a time where the closest points to this one are, uh, or to this red one, are further apart, to a time where they are closer together, they get packed closer and closer because the, the, the space is more filled in with more and more points. As we do that, we are going to see a rise in row. And you'll notice row, row, row rising. Um, it, it, it rises up here, particularly in this area below about 500. It'll rise up and it becomes increasingly dense as it approaches one, okay? Library, yeah, so that, that means how big a subset of this whole time series, maybe we have, this is shown as a thousand, but maybe we have 5,000 length time series, okay? And, and what's shown in the x-axis is we're considering subsets of this. In other words, um, we, we, for any, any say, sir, say for this value here, 500. We're considering windows on this time series of length 500. So we're, we're taking a subset of this time series and we are performing this reconstruction with respect to that subset, which will mean fewer points go in here. And then we are assessing this correlation uh, for the different points in here we pick them and then we assess the nearest neighbors and we figure out the correlation between the value of y for that point we picked and that of uh, and the average uh, value of the y for those nearest neighbors we figure out um, how those relate to one another we do that for the points in this reconstructed state space from the subset and we get a row value out a value of this correlation between the y that is from deduced from the nearest neighbors, the average y from the nearest neighbors versus the point we pick for whom those are the nearest neighbors. And that, that row for that length, for that window of length, say 500, that is something which can, would contribute to one of these data points right here. That's like, maybe it's this guy here. And then we'll do it again, and we'll do it again for different windows and each of those windows leads to some correlation value that's plotted here. And so these, basically as you go up on the x-axis, it's considering more and more complete subsets or larger and larger subsets of the time series. In this case, the time series was about 2000 and so we considered larger and larger subsets and we computed these rows for, for different particular windows because for a given window, say size 500, whoa, um, for that, that will make it really exciting. Um, for, for a given window of size 500 here, um, we might have this window, this window, this window, this window, you know, any number of different windows and each of them will be associated with a row. Okay, for each of those windows. And, and that's what we've plotted out here. We've plotted out the different rows here. And what it will show is there's some variation, right? There's some variation for a given value of L. There's some variation in the rows deduced. But as 
L increases, what you notice is this upwards arc from below, this is important, of, of rho. And so as you consider a larger and larger subset of this, as, as the, essentially as the space becomes, um, as the space becomes uh, denser and denser, you're going to be able to, so that's, as you consider a larger and larger set of it, the space will become denser and denser, the neighbors will be cl closer to the point, the nearest neighbors in state space will go from being somewhat far away, okay, somewhat far away, like, like this guy here, to being closely in. Uh, and for those, and as they become closer and closer, you're gonna be able to estimate this value of y more and more accurately. So the value of rho, the correlation between what you thought y was based on the neighbors and what it is in fact for that point goes up. And that's, that's why as L goes up here, rho is going, is going up. It's because being close in state space tells us a lot about y because y is driving x Y is encoded in the state space, I mean close in state space means we have close values of Y, and therefore as we, we have neighbors that are closer, the values of Y guessed for the underlying point around which they're located is, is more and more accurate. So this is the library size, it's the size of the subset of that time series that we're considering. Is that helpful at all? Okay, now this is with no noise. This is a causal, causal connection. This is another case with no noise. And you can see it just zips into to, uh, essentially being perfect correlation in terms of being able to predict why um, based on the nearby neighbors. Why? No pun intended. Because Y is driving X being nearby in, in state space is reconstructed from X tells you, means you're nearby in Y. Um, you're nearby in this space. Your nearest neighbors in this space as dictated by, this, it's the state space that's giving rise to it. And if it includes Y, these are of necessity gonna be close in Y and therefore the nearby neighbors in the state space are gonna tell you a lot about Y. And that's what, that's what this, um, uh, this is showing. It, it, in both cases, it's approaching, approaching one here, okay? So here we see a causal connection from Y to X. We reconstruct the state space based on X. Because Y is driving X, when we reconstruct X's state space, X is whispering to us about Y just like those waiting times in the ED are whispering to us about the situation in the wards. And as a result, reconstructing that state space based on Y is going to lead to a state space that incorporates Y, and closeness of state space will mean closeness in Y. And so it's to be expected that you're gonna be able to demonstrate that, that uh, you can predict the values of y using nearby points in the state space for x. So this is a case of causality with no noise. We'll be looking at noise later. Noise adds some fun to it. Well, it adds some headaches to it too. Um, okay, case two. Simple case, no causal connection and no probabilistic dependence. There's no statistical relation. There's no, no correlation between them. X and y are here, y is not driving x, okay? Okay, no causal connection. Then closeness in the state space of x tells you nothing about y. The fact that you have a couple things um, close to you in the state space reconstructed by x, these are not close in time. They're, they're close in state space. They're close in, the, in terms of a set of things that are driving x. If, if y is not driving x, these ones will be, you know, at, at just arbitrary points in terms of y. There's no, 
There's no sort of rhyme or reason as to what their values of y will be for the neighboring things. And therefore, averaging their values of y will tell you nothing, really, about the value of y for this, for this point there. And as a result, you'll tend to get a, a pretty, uh, you, you'll, you'll basically see no information about y in x. And as a result, the correlation may be a, a close to zero. Um, and filling in nearby points, making the state space more, more dense, filling in more elements of the state space, so those, it, it's, it's even closer neighbors, won't help in estimating why. Um, these are from very different points in time, and, and they don't kind of have any causal connection. So this is what you'll see. You'll see something like this. Here, we have a degree of variability in results. Um, it's all over the map in terms of what we, what we will see for a particular um, row. Well, I shouldn't say it's all over the map. It's small. It's between 0 and, you know, here's point minus point 0.1 and point 0.1. But basically, you're not going to get any signal as, as you increase the library size, you don't see this increase in row. In fact, row, in contrast to the last one, the last, the last ones were approaching, as you increase library size, they were sweeping upwards. This is coming down uh, here from both directions because as you consider small, small library sizes, you have a higher degree of statistical variability in the correlation. And then it kind of approaches zero here. There's no correlation. No correlation uh, between them in terms of rho, and hence no causal relationship between y on x, OK? Now, this has noise. There's actually quite, quite some noise added. Um, but there's no causal, uh, causal connection. But there's, there's um, it's a noisy system, um, and it's, it's fairly wide. Case three, no causal connection, but there's probabilistic dependence between x and y. So here, y is not driving x, but y is correlated to x, maybe because there's some third factor z which is driving them. So we, we, I don't know if you remember, um, when we were looking at time series from search data online, I showed you a spurious connection. I showed you some connections that were not spurious, say between um, ticks and rashes, where people were interested in rashes as a possible indicator of ticks, or, or um, ticks and Lyme disease. Um, but then I showed you a spurious connection. It was, it was between, as I recall, ticks and sunburn, or something like that. It's a spurious connection because, you know, the seasonal factors, and the seasonal factors drive, drive uh, tick-borne illness. They also drive exposure outside, which, which leads to so exposure outside leads to tick-borne illness. It also leads to you know sun exposure, right? Um, we could expect there's a correlation between them, but it's not a causal connection. So we might have something like this. There's there's a third factor which influences both of these. So they're statistically dependent on each other. Y and X are dependent, but Y is not causally driving X. Why is this important? Well, because if we want to change things, it matters a lot if y influences x. If y is influencing x here, we can perhaps lower a burden associated with x by affecting y. But if y is, is not driving x, then it will be a fool's errand to try to affect y in hopes of affecting x. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, would, it would be uh, mixing the cart and the horse. It would be um, uh, trying to trying to fix something just based on the symptoms. 
So here, to reason this through, uh, we're going to think some about what's going on in the neighboring spaces, uh, the neighboring points. So basically what's going to happen here is neighboring points within, if we reconstruct the state space of X, Y is not part of the state space of X. Uh, y y um, is not a dimension of the state space in X. So per se, being closer in the state space as reconstructed from X doesn't tell us um, directly about, about Y. Uh, it doesn't mean Y is, is similar. However, closer values of X will have close, because if they're correlated with Y, Closer values of X will typically have a, a, a closer, closer value with respect to Y because of this correlation. So neighboring points will tend to be associated with, uh, with tighter values of Y. So what's going to go on here is that we're going to see a, uh, a um, situation where the nearby points will have nearby values of y, but the mean value of y for those nearby points will typically converge rather quickly as, as we consider L. And, and you'll have similar correlation value um, uh, that they'll be maintained after that between them. And more than that, as we're considering denser and denser spaces, what's going to go on is not a, core, not a rise where you're able to better, better predict it to high levels, but rather a, uh, a convergence from both above and below, not from not starting small and rising, but from above and below to a value that's determined by the correlation between X and Y, the statistical correlation. The picture here, I would remind you, is quite different from the picture with causal connections. It's quite different uh, in several ways. First of all, there's this upper fringe or mane here. Um, what did I tell you? The heart of a lion and the, and the body of a horse. Well, that was PMCMC. But there's a mane here um, at the top of it. Uh, it's downward sloping uh, in general, and it's approaching a, a, a quite small, small value here. You see this pronounced um, statistical convergence for small values. This is quite typical below about 200, 250 L. And then it's maintained at, at this level, uh, sometimes downward sloping. Let's compare that by contrast to, um, to a causal connection. Here, the causal connection, as you're making the space more dense, it's ramping up uh, in terms of the, the correlation. And you see this uh, pronounced um, increase in the measured correlation rho as you increase the value of L. By contrast here, uh, with a system without probabilistic dependence or a system with probabilistic dependence, you see a very different picture. You see it it coming down from above, okay? Um, now, um, this, this early fringe reflects the fact that you have great uh, statistical variability. Uh, we've been able to reproduce it in terms of uh, demonstrating statistical variability um, in the correlation coefficient for small sequences. Basically, early on, this, the width of this fringe is, is associated with statistical variability when you have very small window sizes. You're going to just have a grab bag of different things. You're, you're checking their correlation and you're going to have a high degree of variability in the results. Um, uh, by contrast, uh, as you consider a higher L, you're going to have a, um, uh, a, a degree of of correlation that's measured that's related to the correlation between the two, uh, the, the two variables here, okay? So, so this is why we see this and why it's converging to something that's not zero. It's not like this guy where it's converging essentially to zero, but it's converging to a value largely from above 
and in this way that is very different than what we saw with this beaming face of causality. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to show a lot of examples of this coming up. You'll see maybe more than you want to of the upper fringes and mains and the effects of noise. Um, but I'm trying to communicate the basic ideas here. Um, okay, now we can also view CCM as assessing uh, the tightness of mapping between shadow manifolds. Um, the idea here is we have some nearby points in this shadow manifold. To what degree do they map to nearby points over here? Sugihara, the creator of CCM, sometimes speaks about this as kind of a measure which is, is closely related to, um, to what we've been uh, talking about. Okay, so what do we do? How do we assess causal, uh, causal connections? Basically, we perform cross map, what's called cross mapping. So we, so we reconstruct the state space uh, for a given length L. So we have the shadow manifold for, for a given library size of length L. And we, for the different points in that reconstructed state space, we assess the correlation in their prediction of Y between, for a given point, its true value of Y versus the value of y is associated with its neighboring points. Each point in the state space, every point in the state space has an associated value of y. We can just read it off for that same time what the value of y is. And therefore, we can, for each of them, assess their value of y and uh, compute it for, um, compute the the average value of y for the e nearby na na nearest neighbors to this point compared to the value of y for that point. We consider that prediction and the true value, and we do that for many points within this reconstructed state space uh, for, for a library L, and then we compute the row coefficient. Okay, um, and, uh, and here, we will be looking specifically at how row changes as L rises. Fortunately, there's a library that does this for you within, um, within uh, R. It's called REDM. Uh, and in fact, Rho has gone through its code and critiqued it a little bit. And there was, there was a, um, a bug that comes in for certain values of E, it seems, it will, well, you'll see, you'll, you'll see it, but it's, it comes up occasionally. Um, it's very obvious. Um, okay, so in terms of distinguishing true cross map uh, convergence from statistical convergence, there's a set of, there's a set of principles here. Um, first of all, you should, you should look for each L at many particular libraries. So in other words, for a library of size, 50, you're going to want to consider not just list library, but the other libraries uh, along here. And, and their code does that. Um, their code does that, the CCM code that, that is in this R library. Okay? Um, and uh, examining many realizations, many, for, for each L, examining many possible samples will give you a picture. You don't want to just do it for one set of samples, you might get mistaken, whereas if you do it for many, you will get uh, some degree of variability, but you'll probably get a pretty, um, pretty clear picture. Okay, how do we distinguish true cross map convergence from statistical convergence? Well, first of all, you need to recognize that when the library points uh, is small, with small L, rho is quite variable. You're going to want to try different values of E and Ta, and um, you want to you want to look at these things which have many many samples, not just for one for one run. You you should look for the decline of the top envelope. You should look for something like this, which is an indication predominantly of statistical convergence, and you should um, uh, and you should examine. Um, uh, a large number of L for size less than about 250 or, or 200. Um, and, uh, and my observation is that uh, simple statistical convergence often leads to 
a rise in the mean of the rows while L is less than 250. Um, so you have to be cautious about the mean. Okay, so here's statistical convergence, another example of statistical convergence compared to causality um, here. Uh, and you'll note that it's building it from below here. Here you'll note that there's this upper fringe um, and yet the mean uh, is uh, maybe, in some of these cases, it's coming up. Um, and uh, here we're, we're seeing that there's this sort of reduction here and a, a similar sort of reduction of the envelope here. It suggests it's, it's not true cross-mapping. We'll take a look at some more examples. Okay, so here's a non-causal case on the left. These are with no noise, non-causal case on the left, and this is a causal case on the right. This is an example of this, the REDM bug, by the way, that, that you get this. <laughs> I think <laughs> Bo Pu is like the master of, of, of uh, CCM calculations. Well, it's just, um, I think they've, uh, so wrote, uh, so um, Bo tells me that they may have fixed this now in the original code base. We have to check. Uh, we reported it to the authors. It's pretty obvious when it happens. I mean, it's very obvious when it happens. It's, um, it leads to this, this sort of sudden disjunction. Okay, so this is no causality. This is weak causality, and this is stronger causality. Um, so with weak, for non-causal, you see these patterns quite clearly where it sort of converges. You have statistical, this is statistical convergence. There is correlation here between these two time series um, for some or all of them, um, but, uh, but there's, there, it's not a causal relationship. I'd have to confirm that. I believe there's uh, some correlation here. We certainly have others where we'll show where there's correlation. Um, so this is non-causal. This is weakly causal or indirectly causal um, uh, from one to the other. And this is um, more directly causal. And you can see it as kind of sweeping up and, and, and concentrating uh, close to one for many of these. In principle, if you run this far enough, with a long enough time series, it should reach one, or it should approach one in the absence of noise. With noise, it makes it more complicated. Okay, this is with high noise. So this is no noise, this is high noise. Okay, um, now with high noise, uh, once again, this is actually some correlation over here. Um, so in other words, uh, we do have correlation between variables. Um, this is indirectly causal, this is uh, causal here. You'll notice the indirectly causal ones here, the weakly causal, um, they're getting uh, less clear in terms that th they're causal. You can't read this clearly as causal with high noise. Um, there's a causal relationship there, but there's enough noise, it confuses it. But meanwhile, the, the strong causal signals uh, remain quite strong, okay? So you can, you can read them off of this. Um, Okay, so this is uh, direct uh, causality, indirect causality here uh, between the two. Um, uh, the causality uh, mediated by other variables, for example. Um, and here, no causality, uh, but, but, but with noise, as I mentioned. So one, one thing to warn about, there are a lot of graphs which Sugihara and others show which use means we avoid means. I find means to be potentially misleading. To look at the mean only of these, I think impoverishes your appreciation for what's going on. It, it, it limits your, your seeing of these issues with the fringe, and it can potentially lead to misleading conclusions. So I don't trust mean plots with this after a lot of experimentation with them. Uh, they're worth experimenting with, but I think that they are confusing. Um, here, um, we have, we have non-causal 
the relationships between these, but you could see early on they kind of go upwards. Now they don't continue to go upwards, which I think Sugihara would say is a sign that they're not causal, but I just find them too confusing to deal with. I think it's much, much better to deal with these sort of plots. And we have a library which we will share with you that makes these plots easy and makes them really easy to produce. Um, and these take a while to run, but they're not too bad. Now, Bo Poo back there. Bo, if you want to raise your hand so people know who you are. Yeah. So Bo, uh, and actually Luce early on, but Bo uh, subsequently as well, has put in um, large amounts of focused effort into speeding up these computations. Okay. Um, and he's measured speed ups um, that are very impressive in, in by using multiple computers and is now working towards a, a GPU implementation, which will speed this up further. Right now, our, our comfort for doing this sort of work lies within a certain boundary of sizes of data, of data sets. I am uncomfortable going below 100 data points for sure, and 200 data points, um, I, I worry a lot below 200 data points, to a time series of, le of size less than 200 observations. Above 200, I'm, I'm less worried, although you still see these early effects there, and I prefer something above 500. On the upper side, um, it can take hours with the CCM library contributed REDM to handle 2,000 to 3,000 with 1,000 realizations, 1,000 samples here. It can take several hours. Um, I think 3,000 might take overnight or something. And once you go to 5,000, I think it's really expensive. But Bo, uh, your system, um, can you comment at all on the speed ups that you've encountered? Uh, actually, it depends on the how many workers and computers you have. Okay. And, uh, Suppose you have a large set. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, when you add one more computer, I mean, the time can be uh, half. So, so if you have more, so the thing is, uh, the time you spend is much less than just running on one computer. Yeah. Okay. So you could speed it up in principle by 20 times or 30 times and with enough computers. Many, yeah. many with enough computers. So what that means is really computations that can go from days to potentially hours. Um, and then with GPUs, potentially you speed up yet further. Yeah. Yeah, you haven't, you haven't yet, yet seriously implemented that. So, so this technique is valuable um, for, for recognizing causal signals and for recognizing the strength of causal signals. I have a further lecture on this where I provide some additional guidance and lots and lots of examples, which I would like to, to offer um, here, so to provide some additional, um, additional understanding. But the, the basic point should be understood here, that what we're doing is we're looking at data from complex systems, and because they're from complex systems, data from one point of the complex system will encode information about what's driving it across the complex system. And typically it's a variety of factors. It's a coupled system. And because of that, we can take one of those data sets and reconstruct the underlying system that's driving it. And here we're taking advantage of that fact to recognize occurrence of driving from different uh, sources um, and whether one variable is driving another. Uh, this, this approach has been applied in a number of publications. Sugihara himself has used it quite a bit in marine biology because he's in um, Scripps Institute. So he's used it to recognize causal connections between 
different species related to fisheries and so on. Um, uh, we've applied it to a number of data sets uh, within the health sphere. We've also used it uh, for recognizing causal connections between social media mentions, uh, search type of data, and occurrences of events uh, such as suicides. So um, this sort of uh, approach can be used to try to untangle correlation, which um, people may feel is indicative of, of causation from causation itself, and provide a stronger, stronger evidence of just how much uh, causation there is uh, between two variables looking beyond the correlation. Second of all, when you have systems which may exhibit reciprocal causality, um, and therefore it could be, and they're entangled with uh, you know, X and Y being two things where X could be driving Y, Y could be driving X or both, um, uh, you, you might use it to tease out to what degree is it predominantly one way, the other way, or both, or neither. Um, that is both explained uh, by other components. The system that Dorian is going to be demonstrating, I think Christine will be getting them in about half an hour, um, here makes reconstruction of these shadow manifolds straightforward. He also can use it to spot where something in one shadow manifold might go to another, another shadow manifold. At least that was a feature, but I've got to check if it's in the latest, the latest version of it here. Um, so to, to put it in pithy terms, this approach can allow you to use observational data, not data from you know, randomized clinical trials or something. Take observational ecological data and recognize correlations between, between time series from them. I recognize, excuse me, causal connections between time series. The direction, whether one way, the other way, bi-directional, neither, and to some degree, the strength. I will talk after the break about the, uh, some of the, the, the things you have to watch out for. I've spoken some of them about length of time series, about noise, uh, that, that you'll need to consider in practical applications of this approach. Okay, so I see them putting the food out. Are there any questions I can answer about this approach? Yeah, Terry. Will you talk to somebody who might be doing the order? Yeah. Yeah, um, so I can show lots of cases where we've applied it to, um, to situations where the, where the ground truth is known, where the situation is known. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll include those. That's largely to help caution as to the impacts of noise, et cetera. It's to learn to recognize it. Um, I could also show, probably not today, but I could I could pull together some slides tomorrow about an application from uh, from data which which you know shows from the ground up where the data came from and how it was used to to deduce causal connections uh, between them and show um, and correctly infer the absence of causal connections in other cases. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. This is a question a comment that I, I went I recently uh, heard a, a talk about um, tick borne infections and the ecology of it. Mm. The, the guy was arguing, he was talking about how it's when you look at the whole pathogen host, it can be. Mm. Some of the hosts 
actually diminish, uh, the, you know, the ticks don't survive, others do, and understanding that mm -hmm. and understanding the relationship in the ecology between these different hosts, you know, the, the mouse versus the, the, uh, yeah. the chipmunk versus, you know, whatever, yeah. and the effect of predators on it, and, and, and and as, as an ecosystem becomes impoverished, what that does to mm. you know, that, that I can see how this would be really interesting to apply to that. I mean, how is that interesting? Mm. Yeah, I, I appreciate the comments there. I think um, certainly Sugihara has shown in very interesting ways how it could be applied to um, species data in and, and, and some very thought provoking ways. Um, one thing that this does rely on that I, I know for some veterinary science applications is hard to come by is, is data on, um, on you know, observation counts over time for different species, et cetera. Maybe in, in today's world that's becoming easier with trail cams and what have you. But um, you, you know, wanting, wanting to have some some data at regularly spaced times that are observations. For fisheries, that's an easier thing to come by, or for lobsters, right? You could say that well, yes, no, okay. Yeah, but, but I mean, you could, you could uh, for fisheries, it's like the amount of fish caught in a given month of a certain sort, or something mm -hmm. like that. And yeah, I don't, I don't know um, how much of that is compiled for lobsters, although we've seen, seen fluctuations. For deer, uh, deer and mice and and you know uh, chipmunks or whatever, right I know sometimes there's there's difficulty having the the data collection potential to 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 collect those time series. Um, this this gets into the whole West Nile monitoring, um, which goes on here, where I think for a while they collected dead birds um, to do testing on dead birds, maybe with the lab advance associated with, but um, but eventually they gave up because they just said, well, as I understand it, it was so haphazard, they felt, you know, uh, if a bird dies, most birds that die, no one's gonna find, and it's more of, you know, those that do die, um, you know, people might pick them up, but it's it's very ad hoc and kind of sparse and, and uh, haphazard, you know, as far as data collection. And um, maybe there are ways of, of capturing data in a, uh, a regularized way that can be passed before these analyses. One of the things we're interested in doing is um, looking at uh, time series that aren't so regular, that, that might be more irregular in the sense they don't have exact timing, you know, that this was taken day one, day two, day three, day four. There's a lot of data which is like that, and there's a lot of data which falls short of that, where you have irregular measurements, and Maybe, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in how robust this technique is for something like that. Um, or, or you have a different form of data that might be occurrence data rather than count of times, you know, you have it within a certain period or something. And, and again, I, I think there's some work to be done to study uh, how these techniques could be applied for that. Similarly, uh, data involving um, uh, uh, discrete possibilities, or, or um, sort of uh, you know categorical variables rather than continuous. Traditionally, convergent cross mapping has been applied when you have a continuous system, and you know values are are essentially continuous. Um, but uh, uh, you know if you had categorical data, how could you adapt it to that? I think those are areas which have been underexplored. And maybe with some work there, we could, you know, we could think about some sort of application of in the ecological context that could that could address, um, you know, a, a, a zoonotic zoonotic type context. I certainly think that for something like West Nile, that might be a, a place to, to start because there, for example, mosquito populations are kept track of on a regular basis, as is as is the weather, as is um, you know, the, the fraction of them that are infected and, um, and uh, human cases. And so um, you know, that, that might, might, might make a good start. Maybe there are similar things for, for lung disease. So. 
Thanks. That's good. Good uh, thing to, for me to think about. Other other questions, comments. Okay. Well, I think we'll break now and uh, come back in 15 minutes. Um, I think the food is back there, uh, from what I can tell. So um, uh, we'll enjoy that, and uh, then I'll I'll talk some uh, practical considerations when applying this.